Hello and welcome to Selling Sheet Music, a podcast for composers, arrangers, and songwriters to learn more about publishing and marketing their sheet music. I'm your host, Garrett Brees. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you by HolidayChoirMusic.com. Give your choir the gift of new music this holiday season by commissioning a new work or choosing from our exciting collection of music for Christmas, Easter, Hanukkah, and other holidays. Use the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off your first order. Dirk Jan van Groningen is a professional drummer, percussionist, composer, and arranger from the Netherlands. He's the owner of Percussion Books, Show and Marching Music, and Band Music Center. We had a really great discussion about the differences in band music between Europe and the United States, as well as what he's learned as somebody working on both sides of the ocean. Dirk Jan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Garen. Um, So you are a percussionist, you're a publisher, you're a performer, teacher, you kind of do everything. Uh, How do you describe yourself to your contemporaries in in the music business? what, What do you say that you do? Mostly, um, when I introduce myself, I say I'm a professional percussionist, uh, educator, composer. And and, um, recently, I added actually um, the the title musical entrepreneur, because I'm I'm trying to sell the things I write. So there must be something like an entrepreneur in uh, in a musician to um, make his music available online or uh, any bands who wants to play it or percussion ensemble who wants to play it. So that's the entrepreneur in me, I guess, because there are a lot of good musicians who are writing, arranging, composing music, but then they give it to uh, a publisher like you or a publisher like me, and then their story ends. And then there needs to be some goofy people like us who wants to publish it. And they are the entrepreneurs, I guess. I think that's probably the best way of describing the audience of this podcast is is goofy people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you'll feel right at home here. Um, you are based in the Netherlands, and we've had some conversations via email, and I thought it would be a really interesting conversation to talk about just the differences between band music, marching band music, instrumental music in the U.S. versus Europe. Educational publishing is you know a cornerstone of the music industry here in the states i'm sure it's a similar thing in europe although the way everything is organized uh is quite different so could you talk about what you've seen as somebody who works in europe but also in the us just how are how are bands and music education ensembles how are they organized differently in the two places yeah, as I understood that the most of the bands in the U.S. are school bands and most bands in the Netherlands and in Europe as well are community based. So kids are getting music education in school, but not that big as it happens in the U.S. So we don't have a school band. We have we don't have a school choir. We don't have um, jazz bands in school. Maybe um, there are some schools who are doing that, like, uh, and they have the U.S. as their example. But there, maybe in the whole country here, that are ten or twelve schools who are, who are doing this like that, and the other kids kids are getting music education after school. So I teach in a so-called music school, where kids are who wants to learn a percussion, um, they're getting private lessons from me. And then if they reach a certain level, they can choose what, what community band they want to join. Because in the city where I teach, we have like five or six um, community bands. And one of the bands is more like a concert band. They don't march. And then we have like two bands who are uh, marching bands. And the other ones, uh, the first one is more like uh, core style marching bands with uh, high tension drums and all the... The, the image we have of a drum corps and uh, the other bands is is more a uh, traditional uh, marching band with saxophones and flutes and um, a more traditional English drums. And uh, we don't only have a wind band, uh, but we also have a phenomenon that's called fanfare band. And they have like, instead of the, the clarinets, they have um, flugelhorns. So the clarinet parts um, are played by a flugelhorn, and there are also no 
flutes in a fanfare band. So I think that's um, a specific kind of band. It's similar like a brass band. I think a brass band is well known in the US. So this is another different variation of, of a band. So everything is more organized uh, from the music school. And if they reach a certain kind of level, they can join a band or a percussion ensemble or whatever. And, and that's all community based. So it's not done through the schools, but it is done through organizations that set up facilities for this to all happen, right? An after-school program, yeah. essentially. After-school program. Yeah, that's um, what it is. Is it comparable to sports, would you say? I mean, this, are the sports also separate organizations, or is that part of, of schools? Yeah, they have gym classes in school, but um, when you want to do a competition like soccer, which is really big in in the, in the Netherlands and Europe, you have to go to a separate soccer uh, group and uh, do your thing and uh, play the competition and all that kind of stuff. So it's it, it's really similar with music and, and sports. Yeah, you're correct. Is band music in Europe, is it as competitive as it is in the states or is it more for concert purposes yeah we have like uh, we have like usually a, a a competition in the fall and and some competitions in spring so we have like in the netherlands which is a really small country and we have um uh, 12 regions but every region has its own um organization who is organizing things for bands and percussion ensembles so uh, they have like small regional um, competitions and there's even a, a um, national uh, brass band competition, national wind band competition, national uh, percussion ensemble competitions. So um, there's a lot going on. Um, well, and I think you are right in characterizing things in the States, uh, at least for band music. I don't necessarily want to put a number on it, but the vast majority of it happens as part of schools. There are community bands, but mm -hmm. those are typically either for adults who want to keep playing or it's a temporary thing. You know, we're going to get together students from these different schools and give them the chance to play together. I mean, that sort of thing happens a lot, but, but yeah. the center of it is within the school system. I wonder, do you think um, as a composer or as an arranger, do you mm -hmm. think it's easier to sell music to the community bands or to the school ensembles? Does it make it easier to get your foot in the door with the community? That's a, that's a tricky question because uh, what I've I've been selling my music for twenty years to uh, community ensembles, so I don't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just wondering because in the U.S., when you're selling to schools you have a lot more of just administration and, and you know, other departments of the school and budgets and that sort of thing. I'm just wondering if maybe it's simpler when the whole school is focused on music, maybe it's easier to get in touch with the right people as opposed to, you know, being part of a larger system. Yeah, that's actually the benefit of um, what I do for 20 years already that I know a lot because the Netherlands is relatively small and I know a lot of people who are uh, conductors at the groups or conductors at the band and they know me. So, and I think that's what your experience as well. If you know a lot of people, they will find you and, and, and buy and play your music. I think that's but, true. I think, yeah. I think the personal connections are probably the most important thing. Do you think word of mouth is still the most important way that directors discover new music or have things changed in the last 10, 15 years because it's so much easier to look online for that stuff now? I think word of mouth helps a lot because I experienced that if one band director in a certain kind of state is enthusiastic about your music, then the word spreads, of course. But I think you can do a lot with um, what I do the, the last couple of years with email marketing and getting good reviews from people who are working with your books or working with your sheet music. And that helps a lot. And recently I'm working on like um, getting um, band directors who are working with my music um, try to convince them to make a video review. And I, I'm looking for ways to implement these in my marketing. But I think, yeah, and of course, that's also a um, um, certain kind of way of word of mouth, isn't it? Mm. 
So, but I think those are really good. Um, if you have uh, good reviews, I think that's that's really important. And I also um, had the experience. I sent in a couple of tunes a couple of years ago for for the Texas PML, and last year as well. Suddenly, there's an an order from from Texas with someone I didn't know, and he's just ordering my pieces. So that's all. I think that helps a lot when your music is on certain kind of list. Yes, I mean, I think it's good and bad, right? Uh, there's some states where you have to purchase from the list, you know? So if mm-hmm. you're not on the list, you're out of luck. Or or, okay. or that's just where people go to and they don't spend much effort beyond that list. Um, in general, though, I think if you're looking at getting your music discovered by music education in the U.S., um, it's it's reading sessions at education conferences. It's the the festival lists, and it's again mm-hmm. just the word of mouth, finding people to champion your stuff and 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 get it on programs because because we're all looking at everybody else's programs and what people are performing, and we're always kind of I, sh- I say we I'm not a director, but 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 I am still looking at everybody else and what they're performing. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that the way you write music for European bands? Uh, translates to the U.S. or is the style of competition make it necessary for you to change or to write differently for one or the other? I think uh, when I'm writing the the percussion stuff I write is uh, pretty suitable for uh, any middle school uh, percussion kind of ensemble, and I think that's uh, similar because what I do I in in Europe I also have the. Um, I'm providing distribution for a roll-off and tap space with my European company. And a lot of European bands and percussion ensembles are playing those titles as well. So I think in, in the percussion kind of view, it's um, it's uh, the culture is similar, the, the ensembles, the size of the groups. And uh, I, I don't have to make big adaptions when I publish something in the, in the US or in... Um, in the Netherlands. And I think the marching culture is like a bit different because the bands in the US are way more, way bigger than in the Netherlands. Um, so I think when I'm, I need to make some changes then um, in, in, in with balance and all. But I think the, the, the my concert percussion pieces are, are doing pretty well. Yeah. So you have a separate website for your European customers and then a separate website for your American customers. Can you talk about why that was necessary and what have you learned from having to market to and distribute to those places? First of all, copyrights. And maybe that's a a recognizable point for you. Because um, my experience is the last couple of years, it's getting harder to get arrangement licensed. And um, sometimes I'm able to license an arrangement for Europe and not for the US. Mm. So um, that's that's a big reason. And the, the, the second reason is that on my European website, I have all the... Uh, the stuff from the other American publishers I'm, I'm distributing in Europe. So I think that's not interesting for for the Americans because they know where to buy it at their own favorite dealer or JW Pepper or directly. And uh, also for the price range, because when I'm importing music from the US, I have to pay for shipping. I have to play for um, what's happening at the border. Um, so I need to change my prices just a little bit. And of course, I'm doing a lot of stock. So that, that also takes some uh, money. So for the price range, um, that's, that's also important. Yeah, I think those are the, the two main reasons. And on my um, US website, I only have the pieces I publish myself. I think it's even better because... Um, recently, I started adding practice tracks to all the percussion ensemble pieces I wrote. So um, a full recording with a click and a separate recordings from every single part in the piece. And then I also make, uh, every, everybody's laughing about it, but I also make karaoke tracks. So <laughs> without the xylophone or without the marimba. 
and they're all uh, downloadable, available. And that's the great thing of the American website because I can focus on that. And on the other website, I have a lot of stuff from other publishers as well. And it's, it's not that easy to focus on those great benefits. I'm going to come back to the practice tracks, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in uh, what it takes to be a distributor for someone else's music. Can you talk more about that? Like, what are those conversations like? How are the deals structured? You know, lo the logistics of it. Um, that's a difficult question. I'm doing this for such a long time already. <laughs> I, I really need to think about it and, well, and, tra well, and translate it in my head to English as well. <laughs> or, or we could say it this way. If I wanted you to distribute my music in Europe, mm -hmm. what would need to happen? What are the conversations that we would have? We need to have a separate Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Yeah, most of the time you uh, contact the other uh, publisher and, and try to make a deal out of it. And if if he's able to give you some discount on on the regular sales prices and um, and most of the time it starts with a bigger order. Although with the with the companies I work with, you, you make the agreement that every uh, piece which is new and when it's coming out, you take it on stock. And you have to make sure that everything's on the website after afterwards when everything comes in and, and make it available and inform your own dealers again. So they need to know that there are new pieces from um, Mr. Breeze or um, Roloff or Tapspace or whatever. So it's a it's a lot of work. And this is all, just to clarify, this is all still uh, physical print, right? The, the traditional model? Yeah. It's the, most, uh, the most U.S. publishers are still in, um, in, in print sheet music. And I understood that this is really important as well. Because um, when you're performing a piece, you need to have a, an original score, if I'm not mistaken. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, if you're talking about um, like festivals where you're giving your music to a, an adjudicator or a judge, mm -hmm. uh, they basically want to make sure you actually bought the pieces instead of photocopying them. And so that's why they ask for the original scores. Yeah, I understand. So uh, and, and that's what's, he, what's going on here as well. If you go to a festival or if you're going to a competition, you need other, uh, original scores for the uh for the judges as well. So um, we're still getting a lot of big boxes with heavy, uh, heavy paper. Yeah. And it's, and, and the boxes are getting a, a bit smaller already because a lot of publishers are working with a um, download code in the score. So they don't have to send the parts anymore that you can download the parts. And uh, sometimes you're getting the scores, but that's with every publisher that's uh, different. Cause I have like, two publishers who are sending really big boxes and the other one is sending smaller boxes because of the the score, uh, the parts are downloadable. Well, I mean, you teach middle school. Imagine what it would be like if every one of them had a, a tablet and how often they would drop them and break them and lose them. And I mm -hmm. mean, uh, I, I do think digital music is coming, but that part of it still just makes me shudder a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was at a convention a, a couple of years ago and then there was a company who offered a complete system with uh, tablets for all students and a, a master tablet for for the director and every every uh, tablets were connected with each other and when the the conductor uh, skipped to the next page uh, the pages of the students were also and i think it's awesome but i think it's too early maybe and and especially with small kids because uh, the youngest ones are getting in at eight um, in my private classes and at that age they don't have a phone or they don't have a tablet and they need a printed book or printed sheet music when you come to the states you mentioned you've been to a couple of, of conventions mm -hmm. um what is the reception like are people interested i mean are you are you like the exciting european composer that everyone wants to talk to or is it hard oh. to be an outsider and 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 make your way into those conversations yeah, so far it's it's. Uh, I think it's hard to be an outsider. Yeah, because uh, last November I went to Basic, 
and maybe you know that's one of the biggest uh, percussion uh, events uh, on the planet. And then I was a guest at Steve Wise Music because they're selling my uh, my stuff in their um, online catalog. And um, I was there with my flyers and uh, being enthusiastic about my my own music. And I sold a couple of sold a couple of tunes during the fair, but I, I expected more afterwards. Mm. But I think it's hard to be um, a European that that no one knows about it, no one heard about it. We've talked on other episodes of this show about submitting music to publishers, right? Submitting mm-hmm. a single piece. Uh, what do you do differently if you are trying to get a distribution deal and you're submitting, I don't know, 30 pieces? You know, you're trying to get a publisher in the States to carry your music as a distributor. Uh, how is that approach different? Um, or is that not how it works? Is it kind of, you know, you start with a test uh, one or two pieces and then expand? Like, um, the distributors like uh, J.W. Pepper or Steve Wise. Yeah, like Steve Weiss sells your music in the States. How do you convince them to do it? I had to beg. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it takes a lot of time and you have to show you have to show them that your your music is really good and it's working with the ensembles you're writing for. And then it, it even takes it takes a lot of time and I, I need a long breath. Because I was I started this like um at in 2020, just before the pandemic. And then I went to TMEA in uh, in San Antonio, and I think that was yeah that was my first convention I ever did, and uh, I had big expectations of it. And then the pandemic started, and everything collapsed. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I I always say that's a good timing for a percussionist. Well, I I keep bringing up the distribution thing because I. I think for a lot of composers, that's not something they think about, Mm -hmm. Um, especially for composers that are writing a lot of music, because typically if you're a composer submitting to publishers, you know, uh, the amount of music that they take is, is relatively small, you know, maybe two or three pieces a year. And over time you build up that catalog um, or that collection. But if you're somebody who's writing a lot or has a lot of music, uh, that distribution model is another way potentially of getting music into stores or in yeah, front of I people. Think, what you say, I think it's easier when you write some more titles a year because then it's also more attractive for a JW Pepper or a another country to take it in their um, website. And it's in, you're more visible when you're with with seven titles than two of course a year because i i i try to make um seven eight or nine titles every year and not only written by myself but sometimes i i publish some for other uh, dutch or uh, european composers as well and i try to have at least seven eight new titles and then the amount of titles on on a u.s website is of course is growing faster than if you're only producing one title a year. Right. And it's a lot more exciting for a distributor to say, look, we now have 50 pieces by Durkan, you know, as opposed yeah, to course. look at these and two you, new and pieces. You need, to, you need to have a, some certain kind of luck as well. Cause like two years ago, I did like an arrangement of um, Boogie Wonderland by Earth, Wind and Fire. And that's one of my best sold titles through JW Pepper at the moment. So, and someone picked it up and someone else saw it playing and then there you go. Which is interesting because that's not exactly a new song. No, <laughs> but it's a classic one. You know, but the, the, it's funny how that stuff works. Yeah, it is. So let's get back to what you were saying about the practice tracks. Um, you have a lot of rehearsal aids, uh, learning aids, other materials that you sell with your music. You have practice mm-hmm. tracks and the karaoke tracks, and 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 you have a software that they can use to slow it down and all this stuff. Yeah. Um, what has been most successful about that? Is it is it bringing in new people because they find that and it's interesting and different, or is it? keeping the people who already know you happy because it just makes them love you even more? Um, I think both a bit. I, I was talking to some of my new customers recently and he was 
really enthusiastic that he could send a part to his students and, and uh, send the recording. He told me he has a rehearsal once a week, Friday morning, 9.15 till 9.45 for a percussion ensemble. And I think there are a lot of band directors who, who are doing percussion ensemble like that, or maybe in their own time before school or after school, and they don't have that much rehearsal time. So how fun it is that you can send them a PDF at home before the first rehearsal and have their own part separately recorded and have a total recording with a click so they know where the beat goes and they come in um, a bit prepared. They've heard the tune a couple of times, they know what to play. Maybe they have a bell kit at home and play the notes a couple of times or uh, just a practice pad. And it helps tremendously, um, especially when you uh, only re rehearse for an hour or 45 minutes a week with your percussion class. And I think those are the, the positive comments I get. And in my own percussion class, I don't have a, a weekly percussion ensemble. So all my percussion ensembles are on project base. And what I experience if I, uh, I tell them we're going to do percussion ensemble in a couple of weeks, and I send them the scores and send them the, the music and we do some uh, preparational things in the in the private lessons. We can do a percussion ensemble uh, concert in like three or four weeks and then we can do a performance. So it, it saves time. And I understood that uh, a band director is a pretty heavy job for most of them. So I thought that would be a good contribution to uh, save time and uh, simplify their uh, process. Yeah, well, I think those types of things, practice tracks and so on, are more common in the choral world right now. And so I think it's yeah. smart to be introducing that for band musicians as well. Um, looking at all of the different things that you do to market your music, you have the website, you have your email list, you have the freebies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have all these different things. What do you think has been the most successful in bringing new customers to you? Um, most successful is like um, the Facebook advertising I do. So now and then meta advertising and, um, it's so uh, intelligent at the moment. They can find your audience you need. It's <laughs> it's amazing. And of course, the, the, the mailing list helps and the website helps. But if you need to reach new customers, you can target on, on, on marching band. You can target on percussion ensemble. It's, it's amazing. What kind of ads have you run? Are you advertising specific pieces? Are you advertising the website? I've been I've been running ads last year for a a book I wrote which is called Practicing um, Rudiments and Technique is Fun, and I had like a a pretty short video where I played one of the exercises from the book, which was really really groovy, and I advertised that a um, couple of weeks like four three or four weeks, and I think I sold like eighty copies of the book. Wow. So any suggestions for writing an ad that works well on Facebook? Oh, my. That's really hard. I'm still learning as well. I think but, we all are. I mean, I think nobody yeah. really knows quite how to do it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've had success with it. Yeah. Funny things are always uh, helpful because I, I also wrote an ebook which is called The, the 15 big, Biggest Percursive Mistakes I Made. <laughs> so I, I made a list with all the stupid things I did in my career so far. And then I made I, I made a picture with this ad um, my, after a bunch of percussion uh, instruments and with a bass drum mallet in my, in my mouth and a xylophone mallet here and there and a crazy face. Uh -huh. And uh, that one is working really well. And, and a lot of band directors are downloading my, my guide. So I think if you're able to uh, write a ebook about a subject which is really interesting for your audience, that's that's the best beginning you can can do if you want to um, be um, getting more involved in in the in the business in the in the U.S. And I think it it, it works for Europe as well because that that's a really good one with uh, I I got a lot of success with as well and also. I shared this also in a lot of um, band director Facebook groups. 
and there are some um, really strong communities who are really helping each other um, you know, on Facebook, and and they had like amazing responses when I posted it over there as well. So um, maybe that might helpful for um, people who are self-publishing. And I think yeah. you have you have a lot of self-publishing listeners in on your show, isn't it? I think so. And it's the same in my experience. In I mostly write for choirs and mm -hmm. the Facebook groups for choir are very active. Yeah. There's a lot of conversations happening there. In many ways, that's replaced, you know, uh, home pages of organizations yeah. and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just easier to communicate quickly and, and, and throw yeah. a question on really fast. And uh, that's what it is. Oh, one thing I did want to ask you. You have band music, but you also have percussion ensemble music. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to market to a more specific group? Like it, it's somewhat easy to say, oh, band directors, right? That's who I'm targeting. But if you're mm -hmm. if you're focusing on, for example, percussion, you know, is it harder to narrow down your marketing to reach that specific group of people? Um, yeah, you really need to know who you're talking to because I, um, what I did. Uh, that's maybe interesting for the the people as well. I read a really good book about which is written by Donald Miller, and I I don't know if you know the guy, but he's the guy behind the the website Story Brand, and I think it's really good for um, people who are um, um, self publishing music to read that book. So you need to think about your story. Why do you wanna wanna sell choral music? And I think it's also important to think about what what thing can I do different uh, than what the other guys do. And you just told me that it's uh, pretty common in choral music that there are practice tracks and um, and 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 play along sing along tracks. And um, so that's why I, I I made my demos in finale because I write the most of music I I write in finale. And then I, I worked with a software which is called Virtual Drumline, and and I found out that I could make the most amazing demos with it, and I don't needed to work with professionals musicians to uh, make those demos. And I also found out when I exported all my MIDI's to uh, Cubase, I could make even more great uh, demo tracks and really realistic sounding demo tracks. And I thought later on, I thought. Why would I wouldn't I mute all the tracks and and just record mm. the, the xylophone part? And that's where the ID uh, came from. And to do something just a little different than your colleagues do, and 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 make a difference for for the guys who need to work with it. Because of course you can. You I don't know exactly how that is in how it is in the choral world, but you can download a demo of a song. And, and use it for practice purposes. But um, I think for the altos in, in, in specific, it's uh, way easier if they have a recording of their own voice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and that's why I was working about the, the last couple of years to get my story together. And, and my story is now um, more than just sheet music, um, uh, save, save time and simplify your process. And that's also what you see on my website. And, if you have your story together, I think that's the most important thing. Well, why don't we end with that? What is your story? Yeah, that's my story. Do some, do something <laughs> different than <laughs> than your colleagues, and and um, make sure everybody's noticing it. And the most important thing is that what you're doing is beneficial for a lot of uh, music educators. You don't need to be different just to be different, but you need to find something to be different what's beneficial for the scene you're working for. Well, this has been really fun to learn more about uh, band in Europe and, and, and just some of the challenges and the opportunities that exist uh, working on both sides of the ocean. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, my American website is bandmusiccenter.com. And I was amazed when I, I wanted to um, claim that domain that no one else did it because I did it only like four years ago or something like that. So and, and there are all the freebies. You can um, you can download um, some examples of my uh, snare drum method book I wrote. There are some um, other freebies you can download to um, 
get get to know me a bit better. And what about for our European listeners? For our European listeners, they can go to concertandmarchingmusic.com. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today and wish you the best of luck in everything going forward. Thanks a lot. I wish you the same. Thank you for listening to another episode of Selling Sheet Music. If you like the show, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can email garrett at breezetunes.com to get in touch with me, and you can find my music at garrettbreeze.com. Selling Sheet Music is written, produced, and hosted by me, Garrett Breeze. Post-production for this episode was done by Jacob Molaski, and our theme music was written by myself and David Dykstra. I'll see you next week. Now go write something.